Okay. We'll give this a shot. This is a little different than what I'm used to. Um, namely, I can't actually see on my screen what you see on the projector. So my, we'll have to get into a cadence to make this work. Uh, this is, I assume I'm being recorded. Um, that's kind of a bad idea, but we'll see what happens. Um, this is Postgres Performance and Maintenance, as you see. That's the mammoth. You guys all have the sticker. Uh, that's the command prompt mammoth. We're the oldest, at least in North America, we're the oldest Postgres company. We've been around since 1997. Uh, this training is Postgres Performance and Maintenance. I cannot see that. I am JD. You've got my email there. Uh, feel free to email me, although I get a lot of it, just like I'm sure the rest of you do. You're probably better off trying to find me on something like LinkedIn. Um, I am with Command Prompt Inc. I'm also with the PG Central Foundation, which is the nonprofit behind that uh, lovely People Postgres data sticker that you guys have been handed. Uh, we run Postgres Conf which is the largest Postgres conference in the world, as far as we know. Uh, we're going to be about 800 people this year. Um, and then I am with, obviously, I'm a contributor to PostgresQL.org, and then we have PostgresConf there. This is a professional training. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get this uploaded for everyone to be able to download, but I ask that it not be distributed. It's not open source. Um, this is one of the things that I do for a living, so it would be nice if I could continue to do it for a living. This training does succeed based on your participation. Um, you're going to find that if you're not asking questions, you're not going to gain that much from this training. It is a lecture-based training. Uh, we do not, uh, there's no demos or live action or CGI or anything like that. It is all, here is the information. If you don't under understand the information, please ask me. I will be happy to try and help you understand what I'm telling you. Um, obviously, it's going to be a little interesting as I speak exactly one language, and that's English. Um, and uh, so I'm a little bit behind you folks who speak, actually some of the people I've met in the past couple days speak multiple beyond two, which is impressive. Um, so please, participate as you can. All right, here's our table of contents. Uh, like I said, one of the things I do, I do move when I speak. Uh, that might be a little bit hard for the cameras, and I apologize for that. Um, but the other option was to try and use a Windows PC in Russian, and that was going to be a disaster. So we're just going to have to use Linux, which we should be using anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what we're doing, the GUCs, what version operating system copies the curriculum, so on and so forth. There is quite a bit of information in this training. We only have three hours. So I will move fairly quickly. Don't hesitate to raise your hand and tell me to stop, though. OK? I, I mean, that is why you're here. You're here to learn. And I just got to say thank you for being a full room. I was a little nervous. All right, let's get to the beginning of this. All right, so here's the introduction. I've got to figure out a better way to handle this. Hold on a second. That'll work. Okay. This training is designed to provide you with a comprehensive top-level view of Postgres performance and maintenance. We will discuss provisioning on-prem as well as the cloud, appropriate PostgresQL.conf changes, and maintenance items such as the auto vacuum process. Please remember this is a three to four hour training on a topic that many people take years to master. Tra performance and maintenance is very specific to your workload, to your hardware or cloud provisioning, and to what you are doing. A lot of people do some really crazy stuff with Postgres. If you know Oleg, you know what I'm talking about. Please remember, oh, got out of that. Um, in short, we will cover the most important topics, but if you are hoping to understand the genetic optimizer, you're going to be out of luck. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a practical implementation. This is not a theoretical implementation of how to get this stuff done. The GUC, or Grand Unified Configuration, is the name used to identify a variable identifier with the post, within the PostgreSQL.conf. For example, shared underscore buffers is a GUC parameter or variable. You 
he's still there, okay. This training will be speaking about the latest production release. That's obviously not true. We are talking about 9.6. However, everything we talk about here will apply to 10 and 11. There might be a couple of changes with 11, but I generally do not write curriculum for the brand new version of Postgres because it needs to settle down after release and be out for six to nine months before you can get solid production information from it. So this is, I would say, one version back, 9.6, but like I said, it will apply. The operating system used to write this tutorial was Ubuntu uh, 1604, which is an LTS release. You should never run Linux unless it's an LTS release. I don't care if it's Debian or Red Hat or CentOS or Ubuntu or whatever, but if it is not an LTS, a long-term support release, you should not run it in production. You also should probably avoid what I would call proprietary forks of Linux when you're doing on-prem. I'm not gonna mention any names, but they tend to be cloud-specific versions or other database vendor versions, things like that. Let's see if this will work here. No, oh, that didn't work. All right. Okay, provisioning. As with any database deployment decision, you first start with your hardware platform. Nowadays, that platform may be vir virtual or physical. That's actually been the case for a really long time. Anybody who's been doing this as long as I have realizes that the cloud is nothing new. People have been doing it since the 90s. It was called virtual hosting. Um, common virtual platforms are obviously RDS, EC2, GCE, KVM, and VMware. Uh, for those who don't know, RDS is, and EC2 are Amazon, GCE is Google, KVM is the Linux native, and VMware is VMware. Physical platforms are software, rack space, and of course on-premise hosting within a data center or even under the desk. The rules for provisioning within these environments are similar, but there are a few key differences. Every database needs volume performance. This is true whether you are using a DAS, an S, a SAN, or a NAS. Let's talk about a, a DAS versus SAN. DAS, or direct attached storage, has a number of benefits over a SAN or a NAS. The most obvious of the benefit is cost. A DAS solution is always significantly cheaper than a comparative SAN, spindle for spindle. The other DAS benefit is simplicity. Come on, this is gonna be rough. Okay, a directly attached disk will always have better price per dollar than a SAN or NAS. You also can't beat direct attached storage for simplicity. With file systems such as ZFS, it is possible to get a full range of SAN NAS features with your direct attached storage at a much less cost. However, these rules are changing due to widely available open source projects such as FreeNAS. It's also changing because as people move to the cloud, the interconnects to the cloud are much faster. When I got into this business, the fastest interconnect was 12 megabit. Now we've got things like 128 gigabit, if you've got the right hardware. The DS cons, although it is possible to get much of the redundancy that SAN provides, you cannot get all of it. In order to expand your volumes, you will need to use a volume manager on Linux, a common occurrence, or a smart file system such as ZFS. This is particularly important on Linux because LVM is not good. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. LVM is a very lazy implementation of what other people have figured out decades ago. Uh, and I actually, I one time used to teach curriculum on backup and restore and file snapshots and things like that. And when you compare things like file snapshots with LVM compared to ZFS, it's embarrassing. LVM is just not that good at it. Um, so you, you do need to kind of be careful when you're trying to deploy your own do-it-yourself solution. 
Um, it is also using it as a shared resource is not as reliable as a SAN. That isn't to say that Linux, you know, IP SCSI or NFS is bad and bad implementation. It's not. But it is to say that if you buy a SAN, you've got billion dollar corporations who have, I don't want to say perfected, but I'll say fine tuned their particular implementation for sharing the volume. All right, SAN pros, management. A SAN is generally has an excellent management features, including dynamic allocation of space, excellent redundancy, and resource management. It can also be used easily as a shared resource. It's actually, it's, it's pretty impressive what you can do with a SAN nowadays. You can get better performance out of a SAN via multipath. New versions of fiber channel can reach 128 gigabits per second. I think that's actually out of date. I think we can go faster now, but I haven't checked. The cons of a SAN is cost per spindle. The cost per spindle is much higher, exceedingly higher than a DAS solution. Direct attached storage is just cheap. I mean, even nowadays, I mean, you can get if you look at some of the Intel Enterprise SSDs and how fast they are, even comparatively, you throw those into an appropriate server chassis and you're going to be flying at, at, at a fraction of the cost of what a SAN would cost you. Let's make some sense of all this. The short of it is, when provisioning for Postgres on, spin, on spinning metal, SATA, SAS, SSD, or both spinning metal, not SSD. You want a hardware-based RAID controller, battery back cache, and you want to run RAID 1 or 10. Do not run 5, do not run 6. Run 1 or 10. Those are the only database RAID levels. Volumes in the cloud. What the heck just happened here? Where are we? Okay. The average SAS drive can perform at approximately 25 megabytes per second of random write performance. Every write that PostgreSQL performs sans the transaction logs is a random write. Sequential performance is not that important. Even the slowest drives you can purchase have a, de a decent sequential write performance. However, I'm curious how out of date this is, and what I mean by that is who here is running Postgres on spinning disks? Anybody running spinning disk versus SSD? Is it data warehouse or is it OLTP? Sure, okay. Um, if, you, if you only have 25 megabytes available per spindle to get reasonable performance out of the database, you need RAID 10, which requires at least four spindles. The default RAID 10 configuration is only going to give you 50 megabytes per second. That is a stripe over two mirrors. The mirrors are going to give you 25 megabytes each. Now, why this is particularly important is that the SSD in my laptop is 10 times as fast as that. And that's just my laptop. So when you're provisioning, if you're thinking to yourself, should I get SSDs, the answer is yes. The only reason not to is if you are doing many, many terabytes of data, data warehouse type stuff where you need to have 100 spindles that are four terabytes a piece or something like that. If you're doing any kind of reasonably sized OLTP where you're talking one terabyte to say even 50 terabytes, see if you can afford the SSDs. The speed is just gonna be so much faster. The use of a battery back cache can greatly increase the performance of your RAID implementation because Postgres is writing to memory and the controller is push pushing that memory to the drives. A good RAID controller optimizes those writes and writes them in a manner that is most efficient for the drives. I'm gonna take one quick second here and see if I can make this a little better for everybody. Hold on. Okay, so Apparently, QR codes are still a thing. Um, this, if you take a picture of this QR code, you'll be able to download this curriculum. So we'll just take a moment while everybody, I'm just gonna duck. <laughs> The use of a battery back cache can greatly increase the performance of your RAID implementation because Postgres is writing memory to the controller and the controller is pushing memory to the drive. Why is this important? Because good controllers with good drivers 
actually know how to optimize the writes to the drive. It's not just random. It doesn't just sit there and go, hey, I hope it wrote to disk. It's actually pretty smart about it. <coughs> but who runs Spinny Metal anymore? Use SSDs. This is an older version of the data center P3520 SSD from Intel, but it does have the following specifications, which is pretty interesting. It's 100 megabytes, not bits, bytes per second. So it's 26K IOPS, random write at 4K. That's four, that's actually, yeah, that's four SAS 15K drives on random write. It's 1,450 plus megabytes per second, which is 375,000 IOPS, random read at a four block size. Most, most databases are what? They're mostly read. And of course it's random because it's Postgres. Now if you were to look at the specs of the newer Intel stuff, it, it far blows this away. It's amazing how far they've come in just the three years since I've done this research. The further advantage of SSDs is concurrency. They can handle many more requests than a spinning drive. The average 15K SAS drive can only perform about 150 IOPS. That's not that much. A second, uh, 150 IOPS a second versus what you see above. One, megab it's, uh, one megabits equals IOPS times kilobytes per I.O. divided by 1024. Why did you not? Okay. Volumes and the cloud. This has gotten better over the years. It used to be you had to be very, very careful. But when we are talking about the cloud, we're talking about something like an RDS or an EC2 or a GCE. Uh, anybody here, it's kind of a silly question, but anybody here on RDS or GCE or anything like that? How many of you are still on-prem? Meaning you host your own database. Okay. RDS EC2, here's the, where you can find the docs, but here's some general tips if you're dealing with volumes in the cloud. When you're dealing with, uh, with we're going to talk about Amazon specifically. We could talk about GCE. Or GCE is actually a lot simpler. Um, but with Amazon, you want to make sure that the different, you pay attention to the differences because they have what's called general purpose SSD, which is GP2, versus provisioned IOPS SSD. And now they even do things a little different because they actually based your IOPS on the amount of drive the amount of space that you're allocating. And I, if I remember correctly, it's three IOPS per gig. So if you have one terabyte of volume, you've got 3,000 IOPS. And that really isn't that much. You think it is, but it, it's not. I mean, if you do the math of a 15K SAS drive is about 150 IOPS, and you only have a terabyte ver on, a vol on the uh, cloud volume, and it's got 3,000 IOPS, you can kind of figure out how many SAS drives you're talking about in performance. Specifically, what you want to pay attention to on something like Amazon is your volume sizes that are available. So with a GP2, you've got one gig versus 16 gig, or not gig, one gig to 16 terabytes versus the provisioned, I'm not going to talk about spinning with uh, EC2, uh, four gigabytes to 16 terabytes, but your IOPS are particularly interesting. So on GP2, you max out at about 10,000 IOPS. On provision, you max out at about 20. I think they can go a little higher now. I think they're at 25 or 26 now. When this was written, it was at 20,000. But where you start to see your major differences, and this is where you want to pay attention, a lot of people who run Postgres think, I can save a ton of money by using your general purpose SSDs, and you can and especially if you pay attention to the IOP allocation per size. But there are limitations in that the max throughput for your particular volumes. You have a max throughput of 160 megabytes per second with your general purpose, but you can go 320 megabytes per second with your provisioned. And your max, your max IOPS per instance, of course, 75,000 and 75,000. Max throughput per instance, 1750, uh, 1,750 megabytes versus 1,750 megabytes, and the dominant performance is IOPS. Now that we're out of the cloud. Okay, so let's talk about processor. Postgres is process-based. It's not threaded unless you use Post. I think it's Postgres Pro has a version that's threaded. Um, put simply, the more cores, virtual or otherwise, you have, the higher connection count and transactions per second you can expect to be able to maintain. 
Of course, assuming other variables such as proper configuration, memory, and volume performances are in line. Why does this matter? CPU vendors, specifically Intel, likes to talk about how there are four core, or eight core, or 16 core, whatever the chip is you're doing is very, very, very fast. But the reality is, and the secret they don't want you to know, is that all CPUs are fast now. They have been fast for years. And when you're dealing with something like Postgres, unless you're dealing with a very specific type of workload, a previous generation CPU with lots of cores is going to be more effective than a newer generation CPU with less cores. And that's based on the architecture of Postgres itself. Consider the following GCE configuration. For those who don't know, GCE is Google. It's their answer to EC2. If you say you've got a 500 gig SSD, which 240 megabytes sustained, random write, at 15,000 IOPS, I did test this, we actually do get it, running Postgres 9.6 with synchronous commit off. Synchronous commit off is a huge performance benefit, and very rarely do you actually need to leave it on. There are times, especially when you're talking about like synchronous replication and things like that, but as a general workload, you don't need it. Um, using IO zone, here is what we see. So basically boiling it down, if we look at the random write, we can see, so children see throughput for four random writers, it's about the middle of the screen. We have 238 megabytes per second. So we know that we're actually getting the performance that GCE is telling us that we're going to get. Now, assuming we have this great performance, the 240 megabytes per second, we have configured our instance connected to this SSD. Here is some workloads. I use Benchmark SQL for this. Don't use PG Bench. PG Bench is not a realistic benchmark on any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it gets CPU bound. It's, it's a useful utility, but it is not a useful benchmarking tool. Um, use something like Benchmark or SQL or even some of the commercial versions which are much better at driving Postgres so you can see where your faults are in your performance. But if we take this configuration, we have four CPUs and 15 gigabyte of RAM, okay? So we have four workers, that's connections, okay? We're gonna get 476 transactions per second. This is, on a, this is on a pretty standard, simple virtual machine on Google. If we have eight workers, notice here, eight workers versus four CPUs, okay? 653 transactions per second. Now, if we have 12 workers against these four CPUs, we hit 661. Now, I ran these benchmarks multiple times and they were all within noise level of the same results. And why this is important is that it used to be before 9.6, and actually it was before 9.2, on four CPUs, our max performance would have been at probably four connections, four workers. But now with 9.6, and especially 10 and 11, the scale is different. And that is largely due to the work of uh, Robert Haas with a lot of the locking and shared buffers work that he has done. It's, it's some really amazing work. And you can actually, you can also see that as we continue down with 16 workers and 32 workers, that our performance is starting to drop. What we're starting to see is CPU contention against the fact that we only have four CPUs. So there's too many processes, too many backends trying to utilize CPU time, okay? Now, if we step it up a notch and we go to eight CPUs, if you look, it, we see eight CPUs with 30 gig of RAM with only eight connections, we see a huge performance boost. This is where you're starting to see the graph of how connections and processes work together to produce performance with Postgres. This is why CPU count or core count is more important than the generation of CPU that you're running. It's, a, it's also why back when the, who remembers the Opteron processors? The AMD Opterons, yeah. 
Okay, the AMD Opterons, they were beautiful. You could buy a $40,000 machine from Dell that would have 64 cores, 256 gig of RAM, and Postgres would just fly. Now, granted, if you were to compare it core to core with the Intel offering, the Intel offering was faster, but they actually didn't have the core count, so Postgres would perform faster on AMD at the time. And I actually expect that trend to start to continue now that AMD is back in the CPU game. That being said, if we look here, once again, we're getting to the point where the cyan color here at 32 processors, so at a four to one, we see our maximum TPS, 1,509 TPS. After that, we start to drop down again. And it's pretty significant at this level. The more cores you have, the more contention you have, your drop off is gonna be more immediate once you reach the threshold. So we're talking at 64 CPUs, instead of getting the 1500 at 32, we're not even getting 20, uh, 1200 at the 64. So again, this, is, this shows why it's more important to have lots of CPUs that, or lots of cores than less cores that are, that are faster. Now, if we continue forward, 16 CPUs and 60 gig of RAM, you'll see that the inverse starts to become true. Eight workers only does 1800 TPS. And the reason is, is the workers just can't go any faster. Our machine is over provisioned for the work that we're actually doing. But you do start to see an immediate jump when you go to 16. And then even a bigger jump at 32. We're getting 2,800 CPU or TPS per, you know, transactions per second. So again, we're starting to, and one of the things I found interesting about this benchmark, and this might be a 9.6 thing, I haven't tested it with 10. But if you look at the four CPUs and the eight CPUs, it's a three times to four times multiplier at your best transactions per second. But with the 16 CPUs, it's a two times multiplier. We're not getting that higher level. In fact, if you go from a one to one to a four to one, your TPS is similar. So what are we running into here? Why is that happening? Why, why isn't the trend continuing? Well, I can show you in the next benchmark right here. If you look to the left, the box, we've got 16 CPUs with 60 gig of RAM. We already know that. But I changed a few settings in the postgres.conf. The previous postgresql.conf was default. I think the only thing I changed was checkpoint timeout. Okay, but other than that, it was default. By changing a few settings, I upped the shared buffers to 32 gig, I upped the work mem to 32 gig, I dropped the random page cost to one, which means it will favor indexes. I changed my checkpoint timeout to an hour. I increased my max wall size to five gig. And here's the kicker. The database is only 25 gig. Why is this important? Because the database fits in shared buffers. And since the data set, my active data set, everything that's being queried as fast as possible is in shared buffers, which is a cache, now we're getting a huge jump. 128 connections to 16 CPUs is 2,800 transactions per second. Now keep in mind, one of the things that's happening here is we're actually I.O. bound. We would have went faster if I would have had more than 240 megabytes per second. If I would have taken, say, four of those SSD volumes and put them in a RAID 10, we would achieve a faster TPS. But there's a couple takeaways here, and that is remembering that memory is also important to help resolve contention for the process-based architecture. All right, so last but certainly not least, the rules of memory are this. Buy more than you think you need. That's number one. I cannot stress this enough. As a consultant, I run into this all the time where people will say, well, we only need 64 gig. Mm, why do you only need 64 gig? Because our data set is only 32 gig. Okay, but what about your queries? What about concurrency? What about work mem? And let's be honest, memory's cheap. It's very, very cheap. I haven't seen expensive memory in decades. Last time I saw truly expensive memory um, was 
man, it must have been 99, 98, uh, one of the Taiwanese factories got flooded and global supply just shrunk it, it, overnight. Um, so definitely buy more than you think you need. I know you can actually get a terabyte for quite a bit less than 2K now, I mean quite a bit less. If you can buy more than the size of your da uh, databases, uh, definitely do so. I mean, we showed that in the last track, right? Where if you have more memory than your data set size, you can force all of your active data set to be cached, which will increase your concurrency and your TPS exponentially. If you can't buy at least enough to get your active, uh, if you can't buy at least enough, get your, try to buy enough to get your active data set into memory. And I think, I thought I covered it, but I don't. There is a way to find your active data set. If you install PG buffer cache, you can actually find out, you know, just let your database run normal, and then you can use PG buffer cache to tell you these are my top 10 relations. These are the ones that are always getting hit, whether it be the sessions table or the password table or the invoice table or whatever it is. These are the ones that are always getting hit. And it will tell you exactly how much memory in shared buffers that they're using. So you can actually provision, you can say, okay, we know right now we have enough, but in a year's time, we're not gonna have enough, but we have to live with this hardware for three years. So you're gonna be able to at least reasonably assess, okay, let's install this much memory. If you can't buy that much, fall back to your volume speed. Make sure your storage is fast. The way you make sure your storage is fast is you run SSDs. It's just that simple. Unless you want to run hundreds and hundreds of spindles, just get some SSDs. If you review the above TPS numbers, which were up here, dun, 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 you will see that we get very respectable performance at 128 workers against the 16 cores. In fact, we get similar performance to the 32 worker run. This is because the size of the database is 25 gig, which completely fits within shared memory and the file cache. With all these pictures, I'm going to start dancing. Okay, the PostgreSQL.conf is the main configuration file for PostgreSQL. We know this. We are not going to cover every setting in the PostgreSQL.conf. There's an entirely separate training for that. It's called PostgreSQL.conf A to Z, and it is literally eight hours of me explaining every single parameter in excruciating detail. And I'm tired because I'm from Washington State, which is on the other side of the world. So here's the basic syntax. The file consists of lines of the form name equals value. The equal is optional. Don't make it optional. Just don't. The equal's there for readability. Leave it there. I have a saying, and the saying is don't be that DBA. I know a lot of really brilliant people, far more brilliant than myself. Uh, and what I've found is that a lot of really brilliant people like to make life very difficult for those who are not as brilliant. Don't get rid of the equal sign. The readability is important. The parsability, not only from a, uh, a mental standpoint, but if you want to script anything within it is important. You can use it as a delimiter, things like that. And yes, I know you can use space as a delimiter. Comments, the file uses standard Linux, Unix style commenting style of just hash, this is a comment, here's shared buffers, this is also a comment, and then commenting out shared buffers. Values that are common out on the initialization of the cluster, which is init db, are the default values as configured by PostgreSQL on install. If you wish to reset a value, you must, at a minimum, reload the server. There are values that require a restart. Who rem how, who's been using Postgres since Trying to remember when it changed. Let's say 7.2. Anybody been using it that long? So I've been using it since before it actually existed, which is Postgres 95, Postgres QL 95. It used to be, and we actually in the community had an argument about this. It used to be that if you were to say set shared buffers to 4096, and there's, let's say the default was you know, 2048, just for sake of argument. 
and you set it to 4096, you reboot, because you have to reboot, or not reboot, but restart uh, Postgres in order for the 4096 to take effect with shared buffers. You're running 4096 of shared buffers. But then you decide that's too much, and you want to go back to the default, the default of 2048. Now, most people would think, okay, I'm just going to comment it out and then restart again, and it'll go back to the default, right? That's, what, that's the logical thing. That's what every single Linux program on the planet, Apache, all of it used to do. Postgres, I kid you not, we had to argue whether or not commenting out a value should reset it to the default. We had to have that argument. It obviously now does reset to the default. If you've been doing this as long as I have, if you've been in open source as long as I have, you know that open source people like to argue about the most ridiculous things. Um, but there it is. All right, displaying values. The recommended way to show a value is presented to PostgreSQL is via the show command, show shared buffers. Shared buffers, 128 megabyte. You can actually also get this from a system table called PG underscore settings. If you want to get all your, if you don't want to, if, for example, if you don't have shell access and you don't want to run through an iteration of every command that you know, show shared buffers, show work mem, so on and so forth, you can query uh, PG underscore settings and get a specific setting. It's also very useful for automated monitoring and auditing so that you can have monitoring that says, I know that my shared buffer, or even better, my work mem is four megabyte or 16 megabyte, and then your monitoring can alert you if that ever changes. Because who here has been in a position where someone, I don't know how to put it, someone who's a subordinate changed a setting, didn't document that change, and things went weird on your database and you don't know why. Well, yeah, <laughs> so, right, exactly. And my, my favorite actually has nothing to do with this. My favorite is when you still have that boss that thinks he's still good at databases um, and he forgets things like the where clause in a delete statement and the fact that you never, ever, ever, I don't care who you are, how good you are, I don't care if you're Tom Lane, I don't care if you're Oleg, you do not run delete outside of a transaction. You never do that. Other, and if you do, I hope you have point in time recovery running. All right, so overriding values. There are multiple ways to override values within PostgreSQL. You can edit the PostgreSQL.conf directly. Don't do that. I, I know it's old school, and frankly, I'm guilty of this, even when, uh, for those of you who might attend my replication uh, training later in the day, thank you if you do. Um, you know, when I was writing that curriculum, I edited the PostgreSQL.conf directly. It's because I've been doing this for so long, it's almost muscle memory. Don't do that. Use alter system. Alter system is the appropriate way to change your PostgreSQL.conf file, period. You can also use set, set's different, it's usually session specific. So let's talk about editing the PostgreSQL.com file. We all know how to do this, although are there any Joe users in here? Okay, VI, I'm sorry, Emacs, Emacs, what do you guys use? Usually when I stand in front of people, I'm like, who's using VI or Emacs? It's like 98% of the room. What, what's what's the, the Russian editor of choice? VI. Yeah. VI, yeah, okay. You just didn't want to say it. Okay, you, you should be embarrassed. Um, no, okay, so now I do know how to use VI. In fact, the reason I know how to use VI is because I know how to use ed. I've been doing this that long. Um, but I use Joe which stands for Joe's own editor. Uh, it is, and where this came from is I used to work at a bookstore back when I was a young man, and this gray white monstrosity didn't exist, uh, nor did this. Um, and uh, I had not been introduced to Unix or Linux yet, and I had a buddy, his name was David Ulrey, uh, who said, use I think at the time he said use nano, and I hated it. And he said, try Joe. And I said, okay, so I tried Joe, and Joe basically is a text editor that works like the old WordStar processor, word processor. 
I've used it for so long that there's actually a rule in my company. Even though I very rarely log into client machines nowadays, the rule is if we're provisioning for a client, one of the first commands you type is whatever install Joe. Because if I get called at four in the morning because someone didn't pick up their phone who was actually on call and I have to fix the problem before I fire them, Joe better be installed. All right, so Joe, PostgreSQL.conf, as you can see here, we have Workman commented out. We then uncomment it so it takes active. Obviously, there's no difference here. They both say 16 megs. But that is how you would uncomment it. And then if you're running a reasonably modern version of Linux and you are not one of those people that for whatever reason will not use system D. I'm not saying system D is the solution to all problems. In fact, I don't even care, but it is where the Linux world went. Um, you would do sudo systemctl postgresql reload. You can also use pgconf reload. All right, set. Set's a little funky. The use of set is reserved for session, local, which is a transaction, and testing. It will only take effect for cases that you invoke it. The use of set without an optional keyword assumes set session. If you choose to use set, set session within a transaction, this is why it's tricky, the following rules apply. If the transaction is aborted, the value will be reset to the system configured value. So if you are in a transaction and you say, for this transaction, I need 64 meg of work mem versus my default of 8 meg of work mem. And then you run a transaction and it aborts. You roll it back or whatever. It will automatically default back to whatever the system has set for work mem. If the transaction is committed, the value will continue to be used until the end of the session or until the value is reset via set or reset. This is important. So what's happened is, is you have a very specific query that you know because you have profiled it, you've analyzed it, you've explained it, you've yelled at it, and you know that when you run this query, you have to run it in a transaction, just in case, and you need more workmen, but you only want the workmen available for that query. The problem is, is that when you commit whatever that query is, as long as your connection is active, it will stay at whatever you set it to. So if you set it to 64 meg, and you've committed the transaction, you're happy, your application is happy, your boss is happy, but then you run a particularly nasty query that has, say, 100 sorts, all of a sudden, that query can also access that 64 megabyte because you didn't reset it. Now, you would say, so what? It's only 64 megabyte. Well, WorkMim especially is not just 64 megabyte. It is 64 megabyte per sort, per connection. So if it is a query that gets run over multiple connections and has 100 sorts, do the math. It's not a pretty sight. Here's a perfect example, or just a simple example. Set session, work mem equal one gig, explain, analyze. You can do it to check how a query is going to respond to the better work mem, because the more work mem you have, it might change the plan. Set local. Set local is reserved for use within a transaction. Queries happening outside of the transaction will not be affected by the change. So, and you can actually see this take effect here. So if we show our maintenance work mem, maintenance work mem is 64 meg, and we start a transaction, begin, set local maintenance work mem to equal one gig, set, it's telling you, yep, we set it, show maintenance work mem, it's one gig, we're still in the transaction. Re-index table foo, re-index, we now commit, and we show maintenance work mem again, and it has defaulted back. So the takeaway here is if you are changing work mem or any setting within a transaction, you set local, not set. 
And we talk about this again. Here's an illustration of why not set within a transaction. So we show work mem. Our work mem is 4 meg. We start a transaction. We set the local work mem to 16 meg. It sets it. Show work mem 16 meg. Okay, everything's good. Set work mem to 8 meg. Set, show work mem 8 meg. We're still good. We commit and then show work mem is still 8 meg even though we started with the default of 4 meg. Okay? All right, alter system. The main PostgreSQL configuration file is PostgreSQL.com. If we discuss this, there is a secondary file that is stored within the cluster directory. Cluster directory is usually data. But on Ubuntu, and I think Debian as well, it's actually main. Um, it is named postgresql.auto.conf. Do not edit this file by hand, ever. Ever, don't ever, don't edit it by hand. This file is used with the alter system command and enables the permanently setting of postgresql.conf values on the command line. And I, when I say command line, I'm talking about PSQL. I'm not talking about bash or ZSH or anything like that. The postgreskill.auto.com file is loaded after the postgreskill.conf and will overwrite the values set within the postgreskill.conf. So you got two things here. Don't edit postgreskill.conf by hand, ever. Use alter system, because alter system will always override your postgreskill.conf manual changes. Here's an example. So we show work mem, 4 meg. Alter system set work mem to 16 meg. Alter system show work mem. It's still 4 meg. Okay? It's because we haven't reloaded the file. We cat the postgreskill.auto.conf. We can see that work mem is actually 16 meg. We just haven't reloaded. We go in psql ujd postgres h local host, blah, blah, blah. Select pg reload conf. And what that does is actually hop the, the server, the postmaster process, and then we can see by showing work mem that is taken into account. I do not recommend that anybody be at the system shell for Postgres unless absolutely necessary. It is entirely too easy, even for the best of us, to make a mistake and blow away your installation in some way. If you can change it, from a connection to Postgres, that is where it should be done, via alter system and PSQL, PG reload conf, or PG conf reload, so on and so forth. PG reload conf, the administrative function, PG reload conf, must be executed by a super user. One should always validate changes made with alter system by using PG reload conf. That's the other uh, benefit to PG uh, alter system. Alter system is constrained by what a valid value for the parameter would be. We can go in by hand and say, I want shared buffers to equal A, B, C, and reload it, and Postgres isn't going to, or restart it actually because it's shared buffers, and then Postgres isn't going to start because it has an invalid value for shared buffers. But with alter system, it's essentially typed. It would tell you before it wrote it to disk, it is invalid, it is an invalid value of shared buffers of ABC. You, you, just like you can't put text into an integer column. It's extremely valuable. <laughs> Restart, reload, and session. In this curriculum, you will see notes at the end of each parameter that will state how the parameter can be changed. If it is labeled restart, you must restart PostgreSQL for the change to take effect. If it is labeled, you mu uh, I'm, if it's labeled reload, you can use PG the reload conf for the change to take effect. If it is labeled session, the parameter can be changed via session or made permanent via reload. For example, set work mem. Right, so if you set work mem on the session, it's only valid for that session, but you could also use alter system to change it and then reload the value. Units. The postgreskill.conf and associated commands to edit the file also allow for the use of two units for describing the value. The units are specific to memory and time. Memory units are in megabytes, gigabytes, and terabytes. 
I don't know if we support petabyte yet. We might in 11. The following is an example of configuring a setting for a value of gigabyte. Set maintenance workman one gigabyte. This is one of those moments where don't be that DBA. If you look, there are people that do this. Set maintenance work mem 2, 1073374 Now, that's obviously valid. Why are you making me math? I don't want to math. I want to know exactly what the setting is set to, and I want to move on. I'm busy. That's why we put the, me the metrics or the units in there. Who is that? Um, so you use the units. It makes your life easier because, I mean, some people really like math and I enjoy math when it includes dollar signs. I mean, I really do. Even better if it's euro signs because it's better than the dollar. But I don't want to have to think, okay, is this a gig or a gig and a half or 1.2 gig? I just want to know it's a gig. So just use the units. Time units. Time units are used to easily transform values such as seconds into minutes. Currently, the following time units are supported. Seconds, minutes, hours, days. The following is an example of configuring a setting for value of one hour. It's pretty obvious. Auto vacuum nap time is one minute. Alter system. Notice I'm not editing the postgreskill.conf. Set auto vacuum nap time to one hour. Do not ever do that. In this particular, this is an example for demonstration purposes only. Never, ever, ever set your auto vacuum nap time to one hour. You will eventually regret it, and it will be at the worst possible time, like at your wedding. Just don't do it. All right, now we're getting into the meat. One moment, please. Max connections. The maximum number of connections allowed to PostgreSQL, the default is 100. Remember the, the uh, grid in the beginning of this, of this discussion. 100 connections versus how many cores, you need to be careful what you're doing. The maximum number of connections, the default is 100. The cost of launching new connections is expensive. That's why threaded Postgres should have happened 10 years ago, because processes are expensive to launch. Now, it's not horrible in Linux, um, at least if you just observe it from a, from a thousand foot view, but if you ever test the, a, a situation of, wow, that's uh, some great water. Um, if you ever test a situation where you are creating and dropping connections over and over and over and over, you will see your CPU utilization, utilization just crank all the way up. It'll go through the roof. If you put in a connection puller, you won't see that. Now, in threads, it's a little bit different. You don't get quite, it's not as quite as expensive with threads, but we don't have that in the main vanilla Postgres. The higher number of the connections can adversely affect your performance. Each connection requires its own memory and CPU time. Connections also directly interact with the other settings such as work mem. Your max connection should be set as low as possible. I showed that earlier. If you think you need a thousand connections, your architecture is likely broken. You are not thinking about the problem correctly. <laughs> You're very, I mean, it is, and, and I get these calls. I, and you actually, you'll see them on like IRC, you'll see them on over, uh, Stack Overflow, you'll see, you see them all the time. I need a thousand connections. And the response is, you know, do not know what you're doing, period. If you need a thousand connections, you don't know what you're doing. I have seen some of the biggest, baddest transactional loads run on 64 connections because they were properly architected, properly cached, properly pooled, and you didn't have to worry about all that. There is a good uh, article on this GitHub here. It's actually more about uh, Oracle, and I know that's like evil, um, but Oracle and Postgres share a lot of, I'm sorry, did I offend someone by saying Oracle is evil? I'm gonna say it again, Oracle is evil. Oracle is evil. 
okay? But it is actually a really good uh, article on trying to figure out your appropriate pool size and what your connection should be. And I do recommend reading it. it do, if you modify max connections, it does require a restart. Super user reserved connections. I remember when this went in. This was another argument. Why do we need super user reserved connections? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if you don't have super user reserved connections and you run out of connections, how do you connect? It's really quite simple. You are literally out of connections. So, and yes, this was an argument, but if we finally got around to it, and now we have up to three connections, no matter what, are reserved for super users, which is great. Because if you have 100 connections, which you should never have 100 connections, it should be pooled, but if you have 100 connections, you know that only 97 are actually available because three are reserved for the boss. And the boss always needs to be able to connect to his database. My recommendation is five, uh, just because I've more than once found a situation where there's more than one boss, or there's the boss that runs Tmux and connects from one location and then another location and then another location and then you run out of connections. Who here uses Tmux? What about Screen? Okay, if you're using Screen, you're doing it wrong. Switch to Tmux. Um, don't get me wrong, I like Screen. It's one of those old school tools, but Tmux is comparatively, it's like running 386 BSD versus free BSD, right? They're both BSDs, but one of them is really ancient and you don't know why you're still doing it. Okay, just run Tmux. If you change your super user reserved connections, you do need to restart. Now let's talk about resource usage. Shared buffers, this is the bane of many people's existence, especially if you're running an older version of Postgres. Anybody here have a production version of Postgres that is below 9.2? There's gotta be one of you, there's always one. Nobody? I once asked, asked this question and I felt bad for the guy. Um, he kind of slumped down in his chair and he raised his hand. I'm like, so what version are you running? 8.0. Now, I'm like, 8.0? You realize, it, and we're talking about 9.6 here, right? And he's like, yeah, I just haven't gotten around to it. I'm like, okay, well, how big's your database? Because I figured, okay, maybe it's a hobby database. Maybe it has like 256 meg in it, right? No big deal, so what, it's 8.0, it's not like it didn't work back when it came out. The guy had two terabytes sitting in 8.0. Don't do that. It's like buying a Yugo now, right? Who remembers the Yugo? Come on, someone remembers the Yugo, you do? Yes, the Yugo. Yugo was the former glorious, I don't know if it was a republic, but the for, former glorious republic of Yugoslavia's car. They actually shipped this thing to the States. It lasted about three weeks. Just don't do it. Anyway, so shared buffer pool is the cache that maintains the status of hot data, meaning data that is active you in active use. This, remember when I was talking earlier about using PG buffer cache to see what your active data set is? This is what we're talking about. And actually I'm gonna show you an example here. In older versions, previous to 9.3, the common wisdom was to set this to approximately 25% of your available memory for PostgreSQL. So if you had, uh, let's say, four gig, you would set share buffers to one gig. Nowadays, that is no longer the case. 9.6 and up, you can crank this setting way up, and it's very advantageous to do so. And actually, even in 9.3, you could set it higher. But as, each, as I'm sure you're aware, every release of Postgres, we just get that much better, and we make everybody look that much worse. Uh, so we're getting much better at this. When we're in production, we can use the extension PG buffer cache to assist in managing this setting. So here's an example. We've, it, first, to change shared buffers, you do need to restart. But here's a query that will tell you exactly what your top 10 active data set rows are. 
Because let's be honest, a lot of us don't have two terabytes of memory. Okay? A lot of us are stuck in the 32, 64, 128 gig land. And we have data sets that are larger than that. So this allows us to say, yeah, I've got 64 gig of RAM, and yeah, I have 500 gig or even a terabyte of data. But so what? What we care about is the data that is always accessed. That data is the data you want to make sure is cached. Because I don't, no matter what, unless you're using the absolute latest, I don't even remember what they call it now, but there's this new Intel hybrid RAM slash SSD thing that's almost as fast as RAM. Unless you're doing that, hitting the disk is expensive, even with an SSD. So what this allows you to do is say, hey, give me my top 10, and as you see, I've got them here, and then you can add how much shared buffers I actually need. Now, I don't recommend making this exact because it changes, and you want some buffer for the buffers. But taking the amount within an appropriate level, if you have the memory available, and say adding 25% to that, so I don't remember what this equals out to. I don't know if I say, I don't. But let's say, just for sake of argument, this equals out to uh, 24 gig. You would say, okay, I'm gonna set my share buffers to 36 gig. It gives you room to breathe, and also if you go under load where you're under high concurrency, because share buffers keeps a copy of every version of the tuple that is active until committed or evicted, it gives you some room to make sure that there's extra room for the data to be processed within buffers. So here's the explanation. It's the top 10 tables in the cache and how many buffers and the shared buffers memory total used. Remember when tuning that you have to account for every database. Not the, that's an important part. If you have a cluster with 10 databases, you have to run PG buffer cache in every single database and then do your calculations and then make your setting because databases are isolated from each other. There is a correlation to the background writer, which we will discuss later, and PG stat BG writer. The default share buffers is 128 megabytes. It is too small, period, the end. One of the really great things about PostgreSQL is that we still develop like we're going to be deployed on very old hardware. One of the worst things about PostgreSQL is we still develop like we're going to be deployed on really old hardware. It's one of these catch-22 things. You know, in, the, in a lot of the world, it is unheard of to have, say, an i7 Xeon, right? They're running something six, maybe even eight generations back, and they're happy about it. So it's really great for us to be able to say, yeah, you can still use Postgres because I dare anyone to deploy Oracle Evil advanced server on like an i5 from five generations ago. You know, it's just not a good idea. But we can actually still give pretty decent performance at that level. Okay. Huge pages. This setting is only available. Who is running Postgres on not Linux? What do you got? Windows. Is it a lot of Windows, folks? Yeah, okay. That's pretty common. It, oddly enough, so if I ask this in the States, even if there are people that are running on Windows, they refuse to admit it. Um, which is actually a shame because Microsoft is doing some really great things with Postgres right now, uh, lately. Um, but yeah, so huge pages, which is only available on Linux, enables and disables the use of huge memory pages. This can be a huge benefit. We're not going to get deep into it because there's, it's a deep discussion. I could probably do an entire presentation on what huge pages are. And we're not talking about transparent huge pages. We're talking about huge pages. They're different. Uh, and how to set them to see the benefits. If you're interested, go ahead and Google huge pages Citus. They did, I think it was Citus that did it. They have a really good blog that shows the recent performance gains with huge pages. And there's also a great intro to it from Debian on how to set it. But the short of it is, 
Without huge pages, a process, when a process uses one gigabyte of memory, that's 262 144 entries, 256K essentially, 256K entries to look up and manage one gig of memory, of data. On my fourth generation i5 workstation, I have the ability to use one gig pages instead of 4K pages. Instead of using 256K pages to manage one gig of memory, I'd be using one page. Now, for most of us, we never, ever, ever notice this. But if you're under a very heavy, high concurrent load, you can see your overall CPU load greatly drop just by changing this one setting. And people don't think about it. They're like, I, huge pages try, okay. But if you change, you know, whatever. But if you actually set it and you test it, you'll, there's a very good possibility it will help you. It is a restart to change that. Okay, temp buffers. This is a misnamed parameter. And if any of you have done any explain, how many here, I mean, obviously, probably all of you, you've all had to run explain, right? Okay. Explain has some weird terminology in it that actually does not directly correlate to anything. They just assume you know this, um, which is unfortunate. But uh, this is a misnamed parameter as it only applies to temp tables. Okay, so it's temp buffers that only apply to temp tables, e.g. if you say create temp table. This is the total number of temp buffers that can be used for a temp table represented as local in an explain plan. You get where I'm going with this? Why it doesn't make any sense? We have temp buffers that equal temp tables that equal local in an explain plan. Before the temp table will swap or spill to disk in a tape sort. If you are an active user of temp tables, consider increasing this value as it will keep temp tables in memory instead of spilling to disk. It's a very common problem if you use temp tables, you think they're gonna be super duper fast, but you're using them for a lot of data, and then you find out they weren't as beneficial as you thought because everything's spilling to disk. Well, you can increase temp buffers so that it doesn't spill to disk. It does require a restart. Work mem. This is possibly the most theoretically dangerous setting in PostgreSQL.conf outside of the most real dangerous setting, which is F-Sync. Th this is the working memory available for operations. It is calculated per connection per sort. Go back to the person that thinks they need a thousand connections. That thousand connections is running queries with an average of four joins. Each one of those is a sort and a where clause and order by. Do the math. It gets ugly really quick. Historical recommendations are to treat this pr parameter conservatively. However, if you have a reasonable amount of memory, it is possible to set this higher to encourage use of memory sorts over disk. This is true. Even myself, I have worked on literally thousands of installations for Postgres. And for years, I was like, just, if you want to change it, change it at the session, right? If you had a query that you knew needed more work, mem, just use set workmen, blah, run your query, and just move on. Don't change it in the configuration file. The problem that you, with that idea is I'm not a developer. I'm a DBA, so I actually do things right. Developers like to connect to the database and think they know better than the database. And so they would do weird stuff with work mem, and you'd wonder why all your resources were gone. And their response was, is I'm responsible for this module in an application with this many modules, and my module is more important than yours, and therefore I must use more memory. It's better just to try and find a reasonable setting within PostgreSQL.conf if you've got a reasonable amount of memory, it's not a big deal to set it to say 16 or 32 meg or even 64 meg. Just pay attention to what you're doing and make sure you got proper monitoring. Here's an example of knowing how much work mem is being used from explain. Here's my sort method, external merge. I have, I have merged to disk for about 19 meg. Buffers, I hit about 
25 meg. I read that many and I wrote that many. The first sort is a disk sort. In short, we swap to disk to process the merge. Terribly inefficient unless you're running lots of SSDs. The whole query read 800 or 8,822 temp blocks. Okay, remember what I was saying about explain, not really explaining anything? And wrote 8,808 temp blocks. The above are all caused by overflowing work mem. We've overflowed work mem, so all of that is getting swapped out. The temp read write is in blocks, and blocks are what? 8K. Postgres blocks are 8K, just like it's page file and it's page size and all that. So if we do the math, <coughs> approximately 19,352 megabytes plus my temp blocks times, uh, I lost my train of thought, I apologize. So 8808 written temp blocks equals 8192 because it's each block. So 8K times 8808 equals 72 megabytes. So to not overflow work mem, we actually need a work mem of about 100 megabytes because it's the first, the 19-ish the megabytes, plus the 72 megabytes. So that's why it's a pretty dangerous setting. Now the great news is, is you don't need to set it to 100 megabytes. Right? You could double your performance just by stopping the disk merge. Just that first 20-ish megs. Right, so set it to 32 meg. You don't get the disk merge, but you're still writing the blocks. <laughs> Trying really hard not to be too American here. It is something you can set at the session as well, which we discussed. Maintenance work mem. I think we're getting close. When, when's the break? Anybody? Just about now? All right, I'm going to finish maintenance work mem and then... I'm going to sit down for a minute. Um, similar to Workman, but used for maintenance tasks such as vacuum, auto vacuum, and re-index, it is allowable amount of RAM to be used before the process will switch to disk to clean up. It is session modifiable. This is not something to be scared of unless you are very resource constrained. If you've got 32 gig of RAM, set it to 2 gig. I think, I think, I think they removed the limitation now, but I think in 9.6 your max I think is 4 gig. Um, you can set it higher, but it will only use, I think it's four gig. Um, but go ahead and set that up because you don't want vacuum to be slow, ever. You don't want re-indexes to be slow, ever. And re-index concurrently is not always an option. All right, let's take a break. <laughs>